Next up, as women's rights in America look to be on some shaky ground right now with the Supreme Court poised to overturn Roe v. Wade, perhaps Iceland may offer a little inspiration. The nation consistently tops world rankings in terms of the best countries to live in as a woman, whether you're talking about health, economics, or politics. And Iceland's first lady has been digging deep into why. Her new book is Secrets of the Sprakar. Iceland's Extraordinary Women and How They Are Changing the World. And First Lady Eliza Reid recently joined me to talk about it. Eliza Reid, you are the First Lady of Iceland. We welcome you to Boston. You've got a new book out, The Secrets of the Sprakar, which is a plural, I found out, not a singular. Correct. <laughs> Thanks correct. to you. Thanks to you. Um, can, first of all, for us, can you define what a sprakar is? And I'm so thrilled you have a word for this. I love this word too. So sprakar is an old and very obscure Icelandic word that means outstanding or extraordinary women. It's a wonderful word. We don't have anything like it in English that defines women exclusively in positive terms. Talk to me about um, the book itself. Um, you, I, I feel like I sometimes need to say these things up at the front of an interview. You're not saying Iceland is perfect, and you're not saying Iceland is done and equity is re reached and you can just pack up and go enjoy uh, equal rights between men, women, and everyone else in Iceland. But you are saying there are some fundamental things that we and others might learn from Iceland to help bring parity and equity to our world. What are some of those key points? That's right. And I think, you know, one of the key points that we have done in Iceland, as you're absolutely right to point out, we're not there yet. But as a society, I think we have passed the tipping point of debating whether or not working towards gender equality is something, uh, a worthy goal, but how we are going to get there. And of course, we we debate and argue that and move in different paces. But I think that fundamental shift is, is really important. And then there are a number of sort of governmental initiatives from excellent parental leave programs to subsidize ch child care. But I'm also hoping that with the book and, and with all kinds of interviews that I do in the book that I really inspire people on an individual level to show that we really all can be role models in this. And if we keep on our, what I call our sort of gender equality or really our equitability glasses overall, we can all make a positive difference in making this world a better place. Let's talk a little bit about your journey to First Lady, your journey from Canada to Iceland, because it also informs how you view what's happening there as an immigrant, as someone, you know, from the outside. You've got some great sayings in the book, uh, Icelandic sayings about how you, you perceive things. And um, what what is it that you noticed? I love the story about the breastfeeding, um, because here in Boston, our current mayor, Mayor Michelle Wu, when she was a city councilor, actually brought her kids to a city council meeting. And you would have thought this was years ago. Everything mm -hmm. was ending. That's the end of the world. But you also had a very human reaction at a meeting when you saw someone breastfeeding. I did, absolutely. And you're right. So I grew up on this small town just outside of Ottawa, the capital of Canada, never expecting when I fell in love with an Icelander in graduate school that he would one day become elected president of the country. But when I first moved to the country almost 20 years ago now, and I worked for a small software startup, which was a lot of men, and I was in my 20s, and the woman who chaired the board one day, I walked past a meeting, and she was there nursing her baby while she was chairing this meeting with all these guys in this software industry, and nobody cared. You know, Nobody was making a joke or looking away awkwardly, certainly not complaining. And that image still stays with me, you know, 20 years later, even though I didn't have kids at the time and they weren't on my radar, that I thought, you know, if this is a completely natural and normal part of, of a work day, then uh, that's that's a pretty good thing. One of the things, too, you examine is that, uh, and you alluded to it a little bit, is the supports that the government has to help families and also the culture that Iceland sort of has. Uh, I, I love the part about how teenage pregnancies don't happen as often, but if it happens, it's not the end of the world. We'll all help take care of the baby. There's just sort of this, let's support families and women in every way that we possibly can. But, you know, we're coming off the, the sort of era of the girl boss, right, where we all kind of had to get to work and lean in and act like the guys, and that was our model. But in the book, you really do give us some examples of people, women, working and doing in their world without having to be these massive corporate raiders who have it all. Can you tell us the story of one of them? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of the, the important things because how much mental energy and time do we all spend thinking about all the things we are not managing to get done because nobody can have it all, you know? So that's a really important message throughout the book. And, and I speak, for example, to a former member of parliament who also uh, was breastfeeding her baby in parliament and, and was talking about that work-life balance. I have an entire chapter uh, on, on, on women in the corporate world, entrepreneurs who work in various industries all three of those women that I spoke to have young children. Uh, one is an immigrant who doesn't have a family support. One um, is a single mother. One has special needs children. And none of them mentioned that their biggest challenge in succeeding professionally was balancing work and home life. And that to me was something you know, really remarkable that 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 was not the the biggest factor for them. Yeah, the challenge too is, you know, it's it's it doesn't seem to me that it's such a hot button issue this this idea of equity uh, and and here in the United States obviously we're as you, you point out we're still discussing it. What mm -hmm. would be your advice for us to move to that point where we can talk about real world solutions, uh, tools, <laughs> instead of just trying to argue about whether or not it's worth having. I mean, we're still fighting for equitable pay. You know, the women's mm -hmm. soccer team finally won that battle. And they mm -hmm. had to be the best in the world in order just to get paid the same way the guys that are almost the worst in the world are getting paid. What do we need to do here? <laughs> I, well, there's, a, you know, I, it's certainly not my place to be able to tell other people what to do, but I absolutely would argue that, you know, working towards gender equality and all further equality is a human rights issue. And if for some reason that doesn't convince you, you can look at all of the statistics out there that show that societies that are more gender equal have longer living populations, they are more peaceful, they are po their people are happier, and this is both women and men, because the argument as well is this isn't one group against another group or or some zero some game that takes things away from one group um, benefiting another group it's something that elevates everybody in society and lastly i would add though that even if you agree with all of this and even if you think this is important it's not going to happen by itself uh, as we have also seen or it will happen at an agonizingly slow pace and so that's why we really need to uh, keep our eyes on the prize as it were and and really keep persisting i was moved by um the the chapter on your visit uh as first lady of iceland to syria uh, as part of the un group and the and the exchanges that you had uh in the in the refugee camp if i remember correctly that what what did that mean to you and what did you take away from that Thank you. Yeah, it was actually in Jordan and Syrian right. refugees right near the border Thank with you. Syria um, in 2017 with UN women. And uh, one of the things I took away, of course, uh, in the context of my book is that there are outstanding women throughout the world, you know, that we don't have a unique uh, uh, license to them in Iceland. But I, I, it reminded me of how important it was for women to be speaking together, you know, sticking together, women to be supporting each other and using each other's voices and really understanding that we all have something to say. And uh, I, I bought uh, at these, at the, in the refugee camp, the women um, were, were sewing all kinds of souvenirs with the scraps of these um, clo uh, clothing that they were making for newborn babies. And I bought this huge wall hanging there that uh, is the scales of justice and says along the top, equality is my right. And that hangs actually at the entrance to the private part of the residence where, where we live now to always remind me that equality is my right and it's the right of everyone else who lives here on this earth. I want to make a hard turn here and talk about you wearing green um, because I love the part of the book. You know, the scrutiny um, that obviously you get as First Lady of Iceland is one thing, but as a woman, uh, as a public figure, uh, I know in television we get a lot more scrutiny than the men do. They could wear the same thing every day and no one's really going to notice. But if I wear the same jacket three days in a row, somebody writes me from their living room asking mm -hmm. if I haven't been to the dry cleaner. Um, tell, just could you quickly tell the story about why you now wear more green? Yes, uh, we had a visit from the President and First Lady of India. And I also had a very kind letter from a woman in Iceland who signed her name, a master tailor, very polite and lovely letter that said that she really liked what I was doing, but she had seen all the photos and she wanted to let me know that green was not my color. Uh, <laughs> it was the color of dress that I wore when they came in. And so of course I wear a little bit more green now. And I also try to wear a lot of uh, secondhand clothes that I buy at charity shops also to give a sort of message of sustainability. All right, so what's the singular of uh, Sprakar? 
Spracky. Well, you are in, Spracky to Spracker. You are indeed a Spracky, Eliza Reed, the First Lady of Iceland. We appreciate you joining us to talk about your new book, The Secrets of the Sprakar, Iceland's Extraordinary Women and How They Are Changing the World. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much. The book again is Secrets of the Sprakar, Iceland's Extraordinary Women and How They Are Changing the World.